The Life of Our Righteous Father, John of Kronstadt. Our Holy Righteous Father, John, wonder worker of Kronstadt, was born on October 19, 1829, in the village of Sur, district of Pinez, in the province of Arkan Arkangel Arkangelsk, which is located in the distant north of Russia, into the family of a poor country church reader, Elias Sergiev and his wife, Theodora. The newly born child appeared so weak and sickly that its parents hastened to have it baptized immediately. He was given the name John in honor of St. John of Rilla as he was born on the day that the saint's feast is celebrated. Soon after his baptism, the little boy John began to look much better. The pious parents, ascribing this to the grace-filled action of the holy mystery of baptism, began with particular zeal to direct his mind and feelings towards God training him in zealous prayer at home and in church. From his earliest childhood, his father constantly brought him to church and thus fostered in him a special love for divine services. Living in straitened circumstances of extreme poverty, the lad early became acquainted with the cheerless scene of privation, grief, tears and suffering. This made him serious, thoughtful and reserved, and in, and in addition, developed in him a great sympathy and compassionate love for the poor. Having no interest in the usual children's games and bearing the constant memory of God in his heart, he loved nature, which aroused in him tenderness and admiration for the majesty of the creator of the universe. At the age of six, the boy John began to learn and to uh, began to learn to read and write with his father's help. But at first, the lessons did not come easily to the boy. This upset him, but also moved him to especially fervent prayer to God for help. When his father had collected his last penny, he sent him to the Arkang Arkangelsk. I'm really struggling with this name. When his father had collected his last penny, he sent him to the Arkangelsk parish school, and as he particularly sharply felt his loneliness and lack of help there, he found consolation only in prayer. He prayed often and ardently, earnestly beseeching God's help. After one such fervent prayer, at night, the boy was deeply shaken, as it were, as though a curtain fell from his eyes, as if his mind were opened. He became so light and joyful in his soul. The teacher and the lesson he had had the, that day clearly appeared to him, and he even remembered what had been said. Dawn was beginning to break when he jumped from his bed, went to his books, and lo, he began to read much better, could understand everything, and remembered what, and remembered what he had read. From then on, John was able to study perfectly. He was one of the first in his school when he finished, and first in finishing the Arkhangelsk Seminary. He was accepted for study at public expense in the St. Petersburg Theological Academy. While still studying at the seminary, he lost his father whom he loved most tenderly. As he was a loving and considerate son, John wanted to leave the seminary immediately and find a position as deacon or reader so as to support his aged mother who was left without means. But she did not want her son to be deprived of a higher theological education on her account and insisted that he enter the academy. After entering the academy, the young student did not leave his mother uncared for. After some difficulty, he found an office job in the academy administration and he sent the whole of his meagre earnings to his mother. While studying in the academy, John was originally inclined to devote himself to missionary work in the wilds of Siberia or North America, but by God's providence he was called to another type of pastoral activity. One day, while walking by himself in the academy garden, he meditated on his future service to Christ's church. After he returned home, he fell asleep and saw himself in a dream as a priest, serving in St. Andrew's Cathedral in Kronstadt where he had never been before. He took this as a sign from above. Soon the dream was entirely fulfilled. In 1855, when John Sergia finished his studies in the academy, he received an offer of marriage with the daughter named Elizabeth of the Archpriest of the Kronstadt St. Andrew's Cathedral, C. Nevitsky. He was also offered the position of priest in the cathedral. Remembering his dream, he accepted the offers. On December 12, 1855, he was ordained to the priesthood. When for the first time he went into when for the first time he went into St Andrews, he stopped on the threshold, stunned. It was exactly the very church which long ago had appeared to him in his earlier visions. 
The rest of Father John's life and his pastoral activity were centered in Kronstadt so that many forgot his surname Sergiev and called him of Kronstadt. Even he himself, even he himself often signed his name thus. Father John's marriage, which which is the which is the state usually demanded by the Orthodox Church of priests who serve in the world, was feigned, but necessary as a screen for his selfless pastoral labors. In fact, he and his wife lived as brother and sister. Lisa, there are many happy families even without us. Come, you and I, let us devote ourselves to the service of God. Thus he spoke to his wife on the very first day of their married life, and until the end of their days they remained pure virgins. Although Father John once said that he did not lead an ascetic life, of course he spoke thus only out of deep humility. He carefully concealed his spiritual labours from others, and in fact he was a very great ascetic. Underlying all his spiritual labours were incessant prayer and fasting. His wonderful diary, My Life in Christ, clearly testifies to his ascetic struggle with sinful thoughts, this unseen warfare which the ancient great ascetic fathers advised for all true Christians. He naturally demanded from himself strict fasting, both in spirit and body, and he imposed on himself as his rule the daily celebration of the divine liturgy. On his first acquaintance with his flock, Father John saw that he was faced with no less selfless and fruitful, fruitful pastoral labour than in faraway pagan lands. Unbelief, heterodoxy and sectarianism, not to mention complete religious indifference, flourished in Kron Kronstadt for it was a place of administrative banishment from the capital for various depraved kinds of people. In addition, there were many unskilled workers there employed mainly in the harbour. They all huddled together for the most part in wretched hovels and dugouts and went about begging and drinking. The townspeople suffered much from these morally degraded individuals who were called suburbanites. At night it was not always safe to walk through the streets, for there was a risk of being assaulted by thieves. Thus, it seemed our great pastor, full of the spirit of genuine Christian love, turned his attention to these morally fallen people who were despised by everyone. Among these, he began the marvellous labour of his selfless pastoral activity. He started to come to their squalid homes every day, chatted with them, consoled them, looked after the sick and helped them materially, distributing everything that he had, often returning home undressed and even without his boots. These so-called vagabonds of Kronstadt, the so-called dregs of society whom Father John by the force of, of his compassionate pastoral love again made into people by restoring to them the human image which they had lost, were the first to reveal Father John's sanctity. And this revelation was then quickly perceived by all the Russian faithful. One workman tells with unusual tenderness the story about one such case of spiritual regeneration due to Father John. I was about 22 or 23 at the time. Now I'm an old man, but I remember well the first time I saw Batushka. I had a family, two little children. I worked and drank. My family went hungry. My wife went out begging. We lived in a wretched hovel. I once came home, I once came home not very drunk. I saw some young priest sitting there, holding my little son in his arms and affectionately telling him something. The child was listening intently. It all looked to me as though the priest was like Christ in the picture of him blessing the children. I wanted to abuse him, gadding about like that, but the tender and penetrating eyes of Batushka were fixed on me. I felt ashamed. I lifted my eyes and he was looking, straight into my soul. He began to speak. I do not dare to pass on everything he said, but he told me that I have paradise in my little heart because where there are children, there is always warmth and well-being, and that I should not exchange this paradise for the fumes of the beer hall. He did not blame me, no, he excused everything, but there was really no excuse for me. He went away and I sat down and became silent. I did not cry, but I had a, a deep, but I had a feeling deep inside me, much as you have before tears come. My wife was looking at me, and that's how from then on I became a man. Such unusual pastoral labour of the young priest began to give rise to unfavourable criticism and even to attacks on him from all sides. For a long time, many people did not perceive the sincerity of his sentiments and mocked him and slandered him, orally and in print, calling him a fool. 
Once the diocesan authorities even prohibited, prohibited the giving of a salary direct to him, since as soon as since as soon as it was in his hands, he distributed he distributed it to all beggars. He distributed it all to beggars to the last penny. They demanded of him an explanation, but Father John courageously bore all these trials and mockeries and did not change his adopted mode of life at all in order to please those who were attacking him. And with God's help, he overcame all those who laughed and reviled, slandered and persecuted him during the first years of his ministry. But later, when they realized that before them was a true follower of Christ, glorified him as a genuine pastor laying down his life for his flock. We must love every man, both sinful and shameful, said Father John. There is no need to confuse the man who is in the image of God with the evil that is in him. With this attitude, he approached people, winning and renewing them all with the strength of his truly pastoral, compassionate love. Soon there was revealed in Father John the wonderful gift of being able to work miracles for which he was famed throughout all Russia and even abroad. It is absolutely impossible to enumerate all the miracles performed by Father John. Our disbelieving intelligentsia and its press deliberately hushed up these innumerable manifestations of the power of God. But even so, many of the miracles were noted in writing and others were remembered later. The exact record of the story of Father John's first miracle, as related to his fellow priest, has been preserved. This tale is permeated with a deep humility. A certain person in Kronstadt fell ill, Father John's narrative begins. I was asked to help with my prayers. At that time, I had already formed the habit of refusing no one's request. I began to pray and committed the patient into God's hands, beseeching the Lord to fulfill his holy will with regard to the sick person. But unexpectedly, an old woman came to me, whom I had known for a long time. She was a God-fearing woman of deep faith who conducted her life in a Christian manner and finished her earthly travels in the fear of God. She came to me and insistently beseeched me to pray for the sick person's recovery. I remember I almost became frightened. How can I, I thought, have such boldness? However, the old, woman had the, very, had, the old woman had very strong faith in the power of my prayers and was insistent. I then confessed my worthlessness and sinfulness to God, recognized the will of God in this matter and began to ask for the sick man's recovery. And the Lord bestowed his mercy on him. He regained his health. I gave thanks to the Lord for his grace. On another occasion, there was a repetition of healing through my prayers. I then immediately recognized the will of God in these two instances, a new obedience for me sent from God to pray for those who would ask for it. So by the prayers of St. John, a multitude of marvelous miracles was in fact performed and even now, long after his blessed repose, they continue to be performed. The most serious illnesses were cured by the prayers and laying on of hands by Father John, when medicine had been cast aside as useless. Recoveries happen privately and amidst great concourses of people, very frequently when the ailing person was absent. It was sometimes enough just to write a letter to Father John or send a telegram to have a, to have a miraculous cure. Especially wonderful, for example, was a miracle which took place in front of the whole village of Konchansky, which is in the Suvorovsky region and was described by a committee of professors from the military academy who happened to be there at the time in 1901. A woman who had suffered for many years from possession was brought to Father John in an insensible state. In a few moments, she was completely cured by him and restored to the normal condition of an absolutely healthy person. By Father John's prayers, the blind recovered their sight. The artist Zivotovsky described a miraculous downpour of rain, which occurred as a result of Father John's prayers, in a place ravaged by drought and threatened by forest fire. Father John cured by the power of his prayers not only Russian Orthodox people, but Muslims, Jews, and other foreigners who turned to him. This great gift of miracle working was naturally a reward for Father John's great spiritual asceticism, his labours in prayer, fasts, and selfless deeds of love for God and, and neighbour. Soon all the faithful in Russia were streaming towards the great and wonderful miracle worker. The second period of his glorious life and labours had begun. At first he himself went to the people 
at first he himself went to the people within the limits of his city only, but now people from all over, from every corner of Russia, swarm to him. Every day thousands of people arrived in Kronstadt in an effort to see Father John and receive help of one kind or another from him. An even greater number of letters and telegrams were received by him. The Kronstadt post office had to open a special section for his correspondence. Together with letters and telegrams, huge sums of money for charity flowed into Father John. Their amount can only be estimated for as soon as he received any money, Father John gave it away. Not less than 1 million rubles, which is a huge sum in those days, by the lowest reckoning passed through his hands in a year. With this money, Father John daily fed a thousand beggars and built in Kronstadt a unique institution, the House of Hard Work, with a school, church, workshops, and an orphanage. He founded in his own village a convent and erected a large stone church. In St. Petersburg, he had constructed in the Kar Karpovka part of the city a convent where he was buried after his death. To the general sorrow, sorrow of the inhabitants of Kronstadt, during the second period of his life, a period, a period of fame throughout Russia, Father John had to discontinue teaching the law of God, uh, that is catechism, at the city of Kronstadt Institute and the Kronstadt Secondary School, where he had taught for over 25 years. He was a marvellous teacher. He never resorted to those mef methods of teaching which were then often practised in educational institutions, that is, excessive strictness or moral belittling of the incapable. With Father John, Marx did not serve as means of encouragement or frightening punishment. Success was nurtured uh, by his warm, sincere attitude to teaching itself, as also to his students. Therefore, he had no so-called incompetence. In his classes, everyone, without exception, avidly hung on every word. They looked forward to his lessons. His classes were more a pleasure, a rest for his students, than a difficult duty or labour. They consisted of either a lively talk or a fascinating lecture or an interesting story which captured one's attention. And these talks of the pastor father with his children about life made a deep impression on the memories of the students. In his speeches which he gave to the teachers before the beginning of the academic year, he explained as a goal of teaching the necessity of giving to the fatherland, above all, a human being and a Christian, treating the question of knowledge as secondary. Occasions sometimes arose when Father John, having defended some lazy student sentenced to expulsion, took on himself his correction. After a few years went by, the child who had seemed beyond hope developed into a useful member of society. Father John attached particular significance to the reading of the lives of the saints, and he always brought to classes individual lives which he distributed to students to read at home. The character of such means of teaching the law of God by Father John was clearly emphasised in the address which was delivered before, before him on the occasion of his 25th anniversary as teacher in the Kronstadt Gymnasium. It was not dry formula, texts and quotes that you set before them. It was not only lessons learnt by rote that you demanded from them. In bright, receptive souls you sowed the seed of the eternal and life-giving word of God. But Father John had to leave this glorious labour of fruitful teaching for the sake of his even more fruitful and greater labour of tending the souls of the entire Russian land. Maybe we'll pause here. Uh, maybe first I'll ask Father Joseph if you have any thoughts on what we've read so far. Yeah, there's a few things. <clears throat> first off, Archangelesk is up on the White Sea, which is a northern sea that uh, opens out into the Arctic Ocean. Um, Valam is also on uh, the White Sea. These are among the northernmost um, places in Russia. And uh, while Arkhangelsk is not itself in the Arctic Circle, it's, it's subarctic and it gets very cold in there. Um, the Russians breed a hardy lot up in those areas because you have to be hardy to live there. The uh, other thing is, as a child, he had trouble learning how to read. There seems to be not a few of these Russian saints who similarly have trouble reading. St. Sergius of Rodnish comes to mind. He was taught by an angel uh, who gave him a prosphora, and he was able to read after that. Um, 
the other thought I had is, um, I'm not sure if this is true in the Greek church, but in the Russian church, particularly in previous centuries, it was quite common for there to be priestly families where uh, father and son and grandson and so forth would be, would be priests. Uh, St. John is in that line, not that his father was a priest, he was, a, he was just a reader in the church, but he, he marries the daughter of the archpriest of the St. Andrew's Cathedral in Kronstadt. And basically by that, he inherits the position ultimately of being the, the archpriest at the St. Andrew Cathedral, which I believe is that's where he served his whole, his whole priesthood. Um, that was not at all unusual in the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, the um, interesting comment that he received or he perceived a new obedience from God to pray for those who ask for it. Does that strike anyone else like it does me that isn't that really the responsibility of each and every one of us to pray for those who ask for it? But it's just that perhaps St. John's prayers were uh, more productive than ours. But then what is it that leads to a productive prayer life and to have God answering the prayers when someone asks for it? Um, I would leave that for people to ponder. Uh, another thought I had was, the house, that, the house of hard work that he established. This is basically for charity, for orphans and, and widows and, and other people who are destitute or in need of it. It's a lesson our society would learn well. He didn't just give money to these people. He gave them purpose because the name of the, the place itself says it. They were expected to work hard and... Um, as we, we do help other people, that's as important as giving the, the means or whatever it is that we're, they're asking for, is to make sure that there is something beyond just giving them something. Because if you just give money to people very often and nothing else and don't expect anything from them, uh, as often as not, what will happen is uh, it'll be squandered and, and they will not be... Uh, aided in, in improving themselves. Those are some of the thoughts I had. Those are very good thoughts, Father. Uh, I think the the difference that you were talking about is being dedicating yourself to praying for others. We're all supposed to be praying for others, but we're all not that dedicated to it. St. John showed dedication. And I guess it's the first step in God blessing the work of anyone's prayer. The language used as a, it was a new obedience from God is very interesting to me. And it reminds me of something that we discussed in a previous session. And we were talking about how we might have certain thoughts about what we want to do with our future, how we like thoughts about how we want to be in God's service and what we think for ourselves might not actually be what God's will actually is for us. And so the, this is when what we discussed when um, God appeared to St. Nicholas when he was in the monastery and said, this is this St. Nicholas, uh, he said, Nicholas, this is not your vineyard. And the has said that if we pay attention to our situations right now, we'll, we can see or we might be able to see um, things that God is willing for us to do right here, right now, his will for us. I think many times that um, God pushes us in a different direction than we actually planned uh, to go in. Um, I don't know in other people's lives. Uh, I like to say about Greece that... Um, I I came for for ten days and I've stayed almost forty years. Uh, yeah, I was a young deacon and uh, things I didn't perceive things as being well where I were where I was and actually they weren't because they all ended up in 
the ecumenical patriarchate there anyway. And I came to Greece to ask uh, a few people that I knew from summers and times their advice. And, um, but I had to return in my mind, I had to return to the United States because um, that was what I wanted to do. And things never worked out. And I met um, uh, the monk Yosef and I stayed in his monastery and I've been here ever since. There was, so just even going back to the very start of this life, and another thing that struck me was that um, his parents were obviously very pious people and they took him to, they were taking him to church services as often as they could and, and it fostered in him a love, a love for, for the church services. And I'm wondering, like, how many lives have we read where St. Nicholas had very pious parents, um, St. Alexis, the man of God, um, many, many saints that we've read, um, uh, the same thing. They had very pious parents who um, who raised their children to be pious Orthodox Christians from the cradle. And the fruit of that is that their children became great saints. And, you know, I wonder if there's an obvious lesson for us there. Maybe I'll, I'll ask this bit of this question. I think it's a, a good start to your life uh, to be raised with um, uh, Christian beliefs and morals. And uh, not that everybody was, and not everybody that's raised properly uh, will develop that and become a good Christian. But, but it is a blessing uh, for those who um, were able to do that. And as since we have both uh, Ashfish Joseph and Priest Benjamin uh, on tonight, uh, Father Benjamin was born uh, the son of a priest, and he grew up in that atmosphere, and God made him worthy of becoming a priest himself. So it can make the biggest difference the environment that we grew up with in. And that doesn't mean that all that grew up in a good environment will be good, or that someone that grows up in a bad environment might be turned out to be a very good Christian. I think as well, um, even before um, his parents taking him to church services, often he was, uh, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, he was yeah you know, his life was touched by god as a kid as a child when um he was ill and his parents took him to 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 get christened you know urgently and that that is what that mystery i think it put it in the 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 the, the reading is what um healed him as a child or as as a as a baby so i think that was the beginning of of his you know journey in in the church um from from a young age and not that by, by no means am i comparing my own life to, to to the life of a saint but um that resonated with me because I've, I've always been told that when i was quite young um i there were a few complications when i was born and i like my parents were always of of the view that you know very close to to when the child is born, you, you must christen the child. And um, apparently the, the hospital said, okay, we'll let you leave to christen the child, but you have to come straight back. And when they took me back to hospital, they they basically said, dog, there's there's nothing wrong. Um, so that resonated with me because that, that's something that I've always been told in, in, in my life myself. And that's kind of a debt you have to pay off for Luke. <laughs> Yes, um, and and I think while while I while I have the the floor, so to speak, um, a few things that I heard in in well at least the earlier life that that Father Chicken just read was I saw a lot of parallels to um, some of our modern saints. So what Father John did 
with um, the, um, you know, I can't remember the exact words used, but the the sort of um, unruly areas of of Kronstadt um, about you know going to the um, the poor and 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 whatnot. Um, that's one thing that Bishop Philadet, um, so uh, Saint Philaret of of New York, he also he would get robbed by by you know robbers and then the next day he would go out and actually buy back his own possessions from the people that robbed him with whatever little money he had and so so it went so that resonated with me the the, the power of i guess um true prayer or, or prayer with all your heart has that that oh i don't want to say power but um you know i guess the the, the power of true prayer versus Sometimes, uh, speaking for myself, you know, you, you sometimes, I guess, are just going through the motions. Yeah, that's that's very, very true. That uh, when we're doing our daily prayers, in particular, uh, if we let our minds wander or if we aren't paying attention, uh, we're just going through the motions. And it is, it's. Prayer is communion with God. That's how you get power. And I think you can fairly say that it, uh, that prayer has power, because it does. Uh, you're calling on the divine. Uh, with regard to St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco, you're right about uh, what you said. He also had a tendency to walk around uh, San Francisco, and particularly down to Skid Row, where he would uh, give money to some of the people there and, and do other things like that. Um, to the extent that the a number of the parishioners were more than a little concerned about their bishop, you know, just exposing himself like that. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, St. John was never uh, assaulted or harmed or anything like that. There was a story of uh, from the life of St. John of Shanghai, that at least that Vladimir Moss wrote, where one time he went into one of these dangerous places and... Uh, and he told there was a maybe there was a nun following him, and he told her get three bottles of vodka and follow me. And she was like, why? Why do we need these bottles of vodka for? And when they they came across people when they came across people who were giving them trouble, they would just give them a, a bottle of vodka and they'd leave them alone. Um, yeah, I read it in Vladimir Moss. If it's not true, then we can blame Rita Vladimir. No, I, I um, kind of recall that too. Uh, he he did what we would consider strange things like that that turned out to have definite purpose. There's one thing we repeatedly learn from from reading these lives of the saints is like you know Saint Nicholas um, assailed Arius with with words and blows and um, so you can they we we never know whether someone is justified in doing something even that really looks awful. Um, there was a, another, there's another similarity between St. John of Shanghai, uh, because St. John, St. John of Shanghai used to run orphanages and he also would, um, go out of his way to mentor the, the most troubled children. And so we, we read about how St. John of Kronstadt, um, would, would mentor these kids that the schools had given up on. And after a few years, they would be, um, they would become they would be like become useful um orthodox christians and members of society um and the thought i had about this this but there's, there's a quote from i think it's somewhere in the old testament where it talks about he who makes dung useful is like unto the lord's mouth um does your grace know what i'm talking does about and does your grace have anything to say about this the prophet Jeremiah, the one that extracts um, good from useless, is like my mouth, uh, which being like the mouth of God is is certainly uh, the highest calling possible. And and there are people who are able uh, to take a person that could be pretty useless in society and lead them to the life in Christ and make them very useful. And this to me seems to be like a real a real martyrdom because you it seems to me you can't do that without this person 
biting you a few times, not literally, but as in you can't do this without um, without suffering some of your own wounds in trying to help this person. There's a there's story also a pa- in, also- in one of yes. the books called the Arundico, one of the, the sayings of the elders about um, an elder named Evlogius who um, he found uh, he wasn't very good at his prayer rule and he wasn't very good at fasting from what he said, but he was a monk and so he wanted to find a way um, to wash away his sins. And uh, so he found a disabled person on the road and decided that he would take this person to his cell and take care of him and that would be a way to open the heavens for him. But um, the disabled person, appeared to not be an an easy person at all. In other words, day and night, he um, he attacked St. Evlogius for taking him from the street where he was fine and um, putting him in his cell and um, taking care of him, but it was never enough. And um, uh, Saint Evlogio started to think that you know I made this big mistake in taking in this um, disabled person, and he heard of when he was ready to give up on him. He heard a voice that said, uh, "Evlogio, if you return the disabled man to where he was, another Evlogio will be found to take your um, take the blessing." So. Um, they both became patient with one another and they stayed together until their death. Um, you know, we, we read the lives of the saints and we we try to think of the lessons we can learn from their lives. And so we see that St. John went into these um, um, like dodgy parts of town of Kronstadt and he went and and made time to go and he went into the the poor people's homes and and chatted with them, consoled them, looked after the sick, helped them with their material means, even giving up his clothes. Um, is there like I mean, is this something that we can safely mimic and trust that um, God is going to um, is going to protect us? Uh, is this a different? Era? Are we living in catacomb times, and is this kind of a work that one should be careful doing? I'm I'm curious about like what what lessons we can take from this that we can we can use in our own times, yeah, in our times. I think we need to keep in mind that these saints, John of Kronstadt, uh, John of Shanghai in San Francisco, and others, they're not just wandering around the city, you know, gawping at everything. They're going with a purpose. Uh, St. John of Kronstadt, uh, you know, he has a purpose in, in what he is doing. And so in answer to your question, you know, is this something that we can do? The, I think the first question is, what is the purpose that we're trying to achieve? If we keep that in mind, then the answer will flow. In the times that we are living now, or from what I see, it's easy for someone in my position that doesn't have children to say that, you know, it, almost to turn away from the, the thought of having children only because seeing how even in, in young schools um, from, from young ages now, they're teaching things that children really should not be taught or should not be concerned about at all. Um, and how it seems that in the world today, they really are trying to um, break the bonds between the family and and really break the bonds between the children and the parents. Um, It it is becoming more and more difficult from what I can see. And and, um, you sort of look at, at the system today or the school system and you sort of think, well, if I do have children, is there a way that I can avoid this this system or is there a school that is not so um, involved in, in that system and is more family oriented? So definitely um, I don't think from from my perspective it's it's an easy task. 
Keep in I, mind I, that I, China, China, that's been true for millennia. Every generation faces the difficulties of living a, a meaningful and good life. Um, if you look at the last century, we have it easy in many ways in comparison. Um, and you can go back through every age and, and find similar things where uh, the, the difficulty of raising children is, is pretty evident. Um, not to say that things aren't bad here, but the, let's not get overly depressed about today. We live, this is the age in which we live. Let us make the best of it. I think anybody who's having children today is going to have to recognize that they are going to have to provide for the education of their children outside the control of the state because every state is trying to mold children according to their lights uh, and to turn out a population that will adhere to whatever the prevailing view may be. It's a worldly view. It's not a Christian view. In fact, it's pretty much anti-Christian. That said, like as I said before, let's not lose hope. Uh, this is nothing new. We've uh, Christians have faced these kinds of difficulties from the very beginning. So let's pray to God. The last paragraph we reread said, but Father John had to leave this glorious labor full of, uh, of fruitful teaching for the sake of his even more fruitful and greater labor of tending the souls of the entire Russian land. And this is where we, we this is where we are resuming. One need only imagine how a day in the life of Father John was spent to understand and sympathize with the extreme difficulty and the greatness of his unparalleled spiritual labor. Every day he rose at three o'clock in the morning in order to prepare to serve the divine liturgy. At approximately four o'clock, he left for matins in the cathedral. There he was met by crowds of pilgrims who were waiting to receive at least a blessing from him. There were also many beggars to whom Father John distributed alms. During matins, Father John himself always read the canon, attaching great, signif great significance to its reading. Confession took place before the beginning of liturgy. Father John conducted a general confession by necessity due to the immense number of people who desired to confess. This, this general confession produced a tremendous impression on all the participants and eyewitnesses. Many confessed aloud, shouting, being neither ashamed nor shy about their sins. The Cathedral of St. Andrew, which had a capacity of up to 5,000 people, was always full and for that reason communion took a very long time and liturgy did not finish before 12 o'clock. On the evidence of witnesses and, con and concelebrants with Father John, his celebration of divine liturgy surpassed description. The tender gaze at once moving and sorrowful in his face, the radiance of a grace-filled soul, prayerful sighs, streams of tears shed inwardly, spontaneous movements, the fire of sacerdotal grace filling his powerful exclamations, the ardent prayer, these are a few of Father John's characteristics during divine services. A service to Father John represented a continuous, fervent, prayerful impulse towards God. During a service, he was truly a mediator between God and man, an intercessor for our sins, a human link conjoining the church militant for which he interceded with the church triumphant, amongst the members of which his soul roamed during these moments. Father John's reading in, in Kleros was not just a rote resuscitation, but a living, enthusiastic conversation with God and his saints. He read loudly, distinctly, sincerely, and his voice penetrated the very souls of those who were praying. At divine liturgy, all the exclamations and prayers were pronounced by him as though his enlightened eyes saw the Lord face to face before him, and he were conversing with him. Tears of compunction flowed from his eyes, but he did not notice them. It was obvious that Father John, during the Divine Liturgy, experienced the entire history of our salvation and felt deeply and strongly the love of the Lord towards us and felt his suffering. Such a service had an extraordinary effect on everyone present. Not all came to him with firm faith. A few had doubts, others distrusted, and still others came out of curiosity. 
But once in his presence, everyone was born anew and felt as though the ice of doubt and unbelief gradually melted and gave, gave way to the warmth of faith. There were always so many communicants after a general confession that several large chalices sometimes stood on the holy altar, from which a number of priests gave communion to the faithful simultaneously. And such a communion often lasted more than two hours. During the service, letters and telegrams were brought to Father John right in the sanctuary and he read them there, praying for those who had asked him to commemorate them. After the service, accompanied by thousands of the faithful, Father John left the cathedral and went into St. Petersburg on countless sick calls. He rarely returned home before midnight. Presumably on many nights he had no time at all for sleep. It was possible to live and work in such a manner only from the presence of the supernatural help of God's grace. But Father John's greatest glory was his immense spiritual asceticism, a difficult labour. One must realise that practically everywhere he appeared, there instantly sprang up around him a crowd of people who yearned just to touch the wonder worker if they could. His admirers would even throw themselves after his speeding coach, grabbing it by the wheels despite the danger of injury. At the request of the faithful, Father John had to undertake journeys to different cities in Russia. These trips were real triumphs for the humble servant of Christ. Masses of people numbering tens of thousands gathered, and all were filled with feelings of sincere faith and reverence, having the fear of God and a yearning to receive curative blessings. During Father John's boat voyages, crowds of people ran along the river banks, and many on the boat's approach would kneel down. On the Rizovka property near Kharkov, where Father John was lodged, the grass, flowers and gardens were destroyed by the crowd numbering many thousands who spent days and nights camped nearby. The cathedral in Kharkov during Father John's service on July 15, 1890, could not contain those who had come. Not only, not only the cathedral, but even the square around it could not accommodate the people who filled all the adjacent streets. In the cathedral itself, the choir was forced to go into the sanctuary. The iron railings everywhere were found to be cracked by the crush. On July 20, Father John served a Moliabin in the cathedral square. There were more than 60,000 people present. The same kind of scene took place in towns along the Volga, in Stamara, Saratov, Kazan and Nizhny Novgorod. Father John found himself in the Imperial Palace in Lavadia during the last days of the Emperor Alexander III, and in fact the Emperor's death occurred while he was there. The ailing monarch met Father John with the words, I did not dare to invite you myself. I thank you for coming. I ask you to pray for me. I feel quite unwell. That was on October 12, 1894. After the Emperor and Father John knelt and prayed together in private, there followed a significant improvement in the patient's health and there was hope for his complete recovery. This continued for five days. On October 17, he began to worsen. In the last hours of his life, the Emperor said to Father John, You are a holy man. You are a righteous man. That is why the Russian people love you. Yes, replied Father John, your people love me. After receiving Holy Communion and being anointed, the dying emperor asked Father John to lay his hands on his head, saying to him, When you place your hands on my head, I feel great relief, but when you take them away, I suffer much. Don't take them away. Father John thus continued to hold his hands on the head of the dying Tsar until he surrendered his soul to God. Having attained the highest level of prayerful contemplation and passionlessness, Father John quietly accepted the sumptuous attire presented to him by his admirers and wore it. He had to do this as a screen for his labours. He gave away all the donations he received to the last penny. For example, one day in the presence of a huge mass of people, he received a packet from the hands of a merchant. Without even opening it, Father John immediately gave it to a poor man who had his hand outstretched. The merchant was upset and said, Bartushka, it contains a thousand rubles. His good fortune, Father John calmly replied. Sometimes, however, he refused to accept donations from certain people. There is a well-known case when he would not take 30,000 rubles from a wealthy lady. This instance shows Father John's clairvoyance, for she had received the money in a dishonest way, to which he later confessed. Father John was a remarkable preacher. 
He spoke quite simply and more often than not without any special preparation, impromptu. He did not seek fine words and original expressions, but his sermons were distinguished by an unusual power and deep thought, together with an exceptional theological erudition, yet they had a simplicity understandable even to the unlearned. At each of his words, some special force could be felt, reflecting the power of his own soul. In spite of all his unusual activity, Father John still found the time to keep, as it were, a spiritual diary. And every day he wrote down the thoughts which came to him while praying and contemplating as a, con as a consequence of the grace-filled illumination of soul which he was found worthy of receiving from the all-enlightening Spirit of God. These thoughts comprise a remarkable book published under the title My Life in Christ. This book represents an authentic spiritual treasure house and can be placed on the same level as the inspired works of the ancient church fathers and ascetics of Christian piety. In the complete collection of Father John's works printed in 1893, My Life in Christ comprises the third volume of a thousand pages. It is a completely original diary in which we find reflections on the author's spiritual life which are particularly instructive for every reader. This book will remain for all time a striking illustration of how the great righteous one lived and how all should live who, who want not only to be called Christians, but actually be Christians. There are also three volumes of his sermons containing approximately 1800 pages, a marvelous memorial to the saintly personality of Father John and an inexhaustible source of edification. Later, still, still other separate works by Father John were accumulated and printed in separate volumes in huge quantity. All these words and precepts of Father John are the genuine breath of the Holy Spirit, which reveals to us the unexplored depth of God's wisdom. In them, a wonderful originality is reflected. The exposition, the thought, the feeling. Each word is from the heart, full of faith and fire. The thoughts have amazing depth and wisdom. There is a startling simplicity and clarity in them all. There are no superfluous words or so-called fine phrases. It is impossible to read them just once. One must reread them continually and one will always find in them something new, alive and sanctifying. Soon after its appearance in print, My Life in Christ attracted so much general attention that it was translated into several foreign languages and even among Anglican priests it became a favourite reference work. The thought underlying all the written works of Father John is the necessity for true ardent faith in God and the need to live according to that faith in unceasing warfare with the passions and lusts and devotion to the faith and Orthodox Church as the single means of salvation. In his attitude to his homeland, Russia, Father John was the image of the stern prophet of God who preached the truth, uncovered falsehood, summoned to repentance and foretold the approaching chastisement of God for sins and apostasy. Being himself the image of meekness and humility and love for every man without regard for nationality or religion, Father John looked with great indignation on all atheists, materialists and free thinkers of liberal tendencies who undermined the faith of the Russian people and sapped the thousand-year-old political system of Russia. Quote, Learn Russia to believe in one God, the Almighty, who governs the fate of the world, and learn from your holy ancestors' faith, wisdom and courage. The Lord entrusted to us Russians the great saving talent, the orthodox faith. Arise, Russian man, who taught you insub insubordination and senseless rebellion, of which there was none previously in Russia. Cease this madness. Enough. Enough of drinking the bitter cup of poison for you and for Russia. End quote. And he sternly prophesied, quote, The Russian throne is tottering and trembling and approaching collapse. If matters are so conducted in Russia and the atheistic and insane anarchists will not be subject to the righteous punishment of the law, and if Russia is not rid of its many weeds, then she will fall like the ancient kingdoms and cities, obliterated by the, by the just judgment of God from the face of the earth for her atheism and lawlessness. Hapless fatherland, when will you prosper? Only when with all your heart you adhere to God, the church, love for the star and fatherland and purity of morals, end quote. The subsequent events of the bloody Russian revolution and the triumph of atheistic misanthropic Bolshevism showed how much truth there was in the dire warnings and prophetic forebodings of Russia's great man of righteousness. 
In the last years of Father John's life, an agonizing physical ailment was added to the hard labor of serving mankind, an illness which he meekly and patiently endured, never complaining to anyone. He resolutely rejected the orders of the doctors who treated him to maintain his strength with non-fasting food. These are his words. I thank my Lord for granting me suffering for the purification of my sinful soul. The Holy Eucharist vivifies, and he received communion every day as formerly. On December 10th, 1908, having collected what remaining strength he had, Father John celebrated divine liturgy for the last time in St. Andrew's Cathedral in Kronstadt. On December 20, 1908, at 7.40 a.m., the great man of righteousness departed from this world to the Lord, having earlier foretold the day of his death. 10,000 people took part and were present at Father John's funeral, and not a few miracles occurred at his grave, grave both then and afterwards. How extraordinary was his funeral! The entire area from Kronstadt to Oranienbaum and from the Baltic station in St. Petersburg in the Ioannovsky Monastery in Karp Karpovka was filled with, with an enormous crowd of mourners. There had never been such a number of people before at one funeral. It was an utterly unparalleled event for Russia. The funeral procession was, was escorted by an honor guard while military bands played the anthem, How Glorious. All along the way through the city stood troops at attention. The funeral service was performed by Anthony, Metropolitan of St. Petersburg, heading an assembly of bishops and innumerable clergy. Those who kissed the hand of the departed testified that it had not become cold or stiff. Memorial services were accompanied by general lamentations of those present who felt that they, who felt they had been orphaned. Exclamations were heard, our sun has set, in whose care has our dear father left us? Who will now come to our aid, we who are orphaned and weak? But there was nothing mournful about the burial service. It reminded one rather of the radiant Paschal Matins, and as the service proceeded, the festal mood of those praying grew stronger. One could feel that some, some grace-filled power emanated from the coffin and filled the hearts of those present with a kind of otherworldly joy. It was clear to all that a saint, a man of righteousness, was lying in the grave and that his spirit was invisibly present in the church, encompassing with his love and tenderness all those who had gathered to pay their last respects to him. Father John was buried in the sepulchre church, which was specially built for him in the basement of the monastery which he founded in Karpovka. The entire chapel was beautifully faced with white marble. The iconostasis and tomb were also of white marble. On the tomb, situated to the right in the church, lay the Holy Gospel and a carved mitre, under which burned a rose-coloured eternal lamp. A multitude of precious, artistically crafted lamps constantly burned over the tomb. A sea of light from thousands of candles lit by worshippers flowed through this wondrous, radiant church. That is how it was. What is there now we do not know, and where the holy relics of the man of righteousness of Russia are today, he who was the crown of the magnificent choir of all the saints who shone forth in the Russian lands is not known to us. Reports have reached us that the atheistic government has closed entry to the sepulchre, but this has not altogether stopped the flow of pilgrims. The faithful began to come and pray outside, making prostrations near the place in the lower church where the white marble tomb stood, so dear to the heart of each true believing Orthodox person. On June 3rd, 1964, the great task of the canonization of our wondrous man of righteousness by the grace of God was accomplished by a resolution of the Council of Bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia. The days of the solemn commemoration of his holy memory were set for October 19 and December 20, according to the Orthodox calendar, when the specially composed service is celebrated. Oh, if this joyful event could resurrect in the hearts of all Orthodox Russian people the most important testament of the ever memorable Father John and inspire them to follow him resolu resolutely. This is a quote. We are in need of a general moral purification, a deep national repentance, a change from pagan to Christian morals. Let us purify ourselves. Let us wash ourselves with tears of repentance, make peace with God, and he will be reconciled to us, end quote. Through the prayers of our holy, righteous Father John, may this come to pass. 
and that's the end of the life. Um, maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe this was actually printed. I don't actually have a date on this. This might have been printed later, like you know, 1980s, 1990s. Um, Father Joseph, did you have any thoughts on this? The first is that rather unique and famous um, hearing of con general confessions, which anybody who's orthodox and gone to confession knows, <clears throat> as a rule, we do not do general confession. Uh, the individual goes to the priest, confesses sins to the priest, has the priest put an epitrial over his head, and receives absolution that way. Um, St. John gained notoriety or fame um, somewhat gradually in the late 19th century. And um, as, you, as you read, I mean, he was doing daily services. Um, more and more people start coming. More and more people want confession from him. And so he went to the Holy Synod and asked for a blessing to hear uh, just general confessions and give a general absolution, which he would do after these people are shouting out their sins. And, and uh, more than one account has talked about how chilling it was to hear all of this. Um, he would raise his epitrial and basically like the like deacon does during the liturgy, he'd, he'd go in a semicircle around pronouncing the, uh, from the ambon, pronouncing the, the absolution. The important point here is that when people would come to con communion, having made a general confession, he would know whether or not they had properly confessed and were um, properly repentant. Um, now, and I've heard that multiple times. This is, I think, the first time I've heard that there were multiple chalices for these communions, um, which I can understand. I mean, at the glorification of St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco, communion was given from nine chalices. It does make you wonder how the other people, the other priests, knew who had properly confessed or not. But um, I'm assuming that uh, God provided some way in which people who were not truly repentant or, or not truly absolved uh, would have somehow been prevented from receiving communion. And I've seen this happen. Um, another interesting point is that um, they began matins at four in the morning before liturgy. In the Russian church outside Russia, matins would be done uh, in the evening, even if it wasn't a, a vigil. Typically, there would be vespers and then a break and then matins starting a few minutes later. There are some individual examples, particularly in monasteries, where matins will be served in the morning. The, the, the Greek church, of course, uses that practice as a general rule. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that in his cathedral or in the cathedral of St. Andrew in Kronstadt, uh, they were doing the daily matin service in the morning but they would then be followed by the hours be between matins and liturgy. Um, and so you think about it, these services start at four in the morning and they're not done until afternoon. That's a long time. And yet the church is full and it holds 5,000 people. It's full to overflowing. Communion takes a couple hours. Uh, well, again, at the glorification of St. John, the communion, the communion of the clergy took about an hour. There were, uh, I think it was 12 bishops, about 90 or 100 priests, and um, I don't remember how many deacons, but it was like 20 or, or 30 or 40 uh, deacons. So there was a long time for the clergy taking communion. And the laity taking communion was even longer than that. Um, I don't know, remember how much, how long it was. I didn't have, I wasn't timing it with my watch or anything like that. Um, so it, the, the, the reference point I have for, for his daily services is this extraordinary, unique event of the glorification of St. John, because that's the only time I've been in a service where there are that many thousands of people. Uh, so 
those are some th interesting thoughts. It's also notice, uh, noted, you know, I mentioned that he would be able to tell when somebody wasn't properly prepared to receive communion. He was clairvoyant. He could refuse money that was uh, uh, gained in a dishonest way. Uh, God knows all of our thoughts. That's an important point to keep in mind. We can fool people, we can even fool ourselves, but we can never fool God. What do we take from the fact that he wouldn't take dishonest money? Uh, is that, I mean, it seems like that's something that, that we should try to emulate too. If we know that someone's trying to give us money or if there's an opportunity to earn money that's not honest, we should we should reject it. The church tells us not to take money that is, is not uh, honorably uh, obtained. That's, uh, if it's obtained through sins or through dishonesty or, well, theft or what have you, uh, beating down people, those kinds of things. Uh, there's numerous examples in the lives of saints where, where the church tells us not to, to touch that, uh, that the people need to go and repent first. There's a maybe a, a trickier question here, and it's probably something which is more common. Um, if someone's working, if someone is slacking off at work, but is still drawing their full wages, I mean, what, what should they do about that, Father? They should put in a, uh, a legitimate or a proper work effort. They're being paid. They need to, to give an honest, uh, honest labor for their work. You were talking before, Father, about how St. John um, was doing matins in the morning, and we, we read that he attached great significance to the reading of the canon during matins, and he read it himself. Do we do we take anything from that? And my, I'm kind of I'm wondering if if when we're praying to a certain saint, are we are we developing like a more intimate personal relationship with that saint? Is, is that how it works? Well, there's really two questions there, just in terms of uh, do we develop a relationship with the saints when we pray to them? The answer is yes, just as we develop a relationship with, with Christ himself when, or God himself when we, when we pray to God. Um, he, his, the, conversation, or the, the, the reading said when he was reading on the Kleros, it was as if it were conversation with God. And when he was serving, there was a, um, a, a re true reality of, of the presence of God in the, in the service. So uh, when we're praying or when we're uh, contemplating the, the saints or God himself, yes, we definitely do, uh, develop a relationship. That's how we do it. Um, as far as um, special significance to his reading the canon, there are several canons that the church appoints for the, the priests to read. The unction canon is one of them. Um, and I think it's uh, on the, the Matins of Holy Saturday done on, on Friday night. Um, the um, the burial matins for for Christ's burial, which is what that service is, I believe, if I remember correctly, the the clergy read the triparia of that canon as well. And there may be some other ones as as well as as that. Uh, I could be wrong about which one it is. I know there's one during at least one during Holy Week where. Where the priests will read the the tripari of the canon, uh, the cleros, the the choir basically just sings the um, hermosi and the caravasia. It's more solemn that way, and I think in the case of Saint John, there was a, a personal love for reading in the church and reading those hymns because if you think about what's being said in in the canon triparia, uh, the essence of the feast or the the saint's life are revealed through those troparia uh, as they are just more generally uh, in both the vespers and matins uh, and when it's it's such a shame that so few people uh, attend the evening services where where the this is all re uh, 
revealed and, and exposed and just attending the liturgy the liturgy itself is of course a it's a in a category by itself but in terms of the hymns and the other stuff that comes out of the the services the liturgy is pretty much a fixed service the the same uh hymns are used over and over again it's basically the only things dealing with the feast are going to be the kandaki and the tri uh, triparia the uh, the the scriptural readings um, and then the um, the hymn that follows the consecration uh, uh, to the Theotokos. So the services have instructional uh, value to them if we are attuned to them and we pay attention. There's something as well that there's a quote from, there was a quote from St. John in this life talking about Russia and he said, hapless fatherland, when will you prosper? Only when with all your heart you adhere to God, the church, love for the czar and fatherland and purity of morals. And I'm wondering, Father, if, it, if I can't really articulate, I can't articulate why, but I, I feel I feel like this is this is true for all of us, even those of us who aren't Russians by blood and and aren't in Russia. Um, and I don't know if it's only true for us in in the Russian True Orthodox Church, but for 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 anyone else who might be in a True Orthodox synod who's outside of Russia. But it does feel like there's something essential to to loving the Tsar. This seems to me like a fundamental thing that um, all Orthodox Christians should aspire aspire to the the Tsar and the Tsarina, the the royal martyrs, but I, I can't actually I can't actually articulate why, and I'm wondering what your thoughts thoughts are on that, Father. Uh, the the Russian Tsar is the most recent, in effect, Roman emperor uh, closest to us in time, because if you if you look at where the the mantle of the empire um, resides, uh, the at the after the conversion of Saint Constantine, the Roman emperors they were a mixed bag, but by and large they were um, they were the emperors of the state of the of the community. The Roman Empire being the primary community, that of course uh, was especially true in Constantinople, the New Rome, and uh, of course the modern historians call it the Byzantine Emperor, Empire. But if you if you actually look at what the the people of uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, called themselves, they called themselves Romans. That they con they considered themselves to be the continuation of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire doesn't fall until, what was it, 1453 or something like that. The Russians, of course, pick up on that. And especially after the Peter the Great calls himself emperor instead of just Tsar, um, they proclaim Moscow to be the third Rome. Whatever you may think about that, there is some truth in terms of having an Orthodox emperor who sees his responsibility, not just being for the land in which he is, but for being the protector of all the other Orthodox Christians. And this is one of the things you see where the Russian emperors were involving themselves in the Holy Land, in Greece, um, in Turkey for that matter, um, or in the Ottoman Empire, and they are there as protectors. A lot of the places that they built uh, in the Holy Land, uh, you know, they continue to this day. We visited some of them when we were there in October, in November. Um, all that being said, there were, of course, Christians who were not part of the Roman Empire, who were outside of it. Um, I mean, St. Thomas went to India. Um, and there, there were Christians in Persia. There were Christians uh, 
basically throughout the world. Uh, and they, they were not subjects of the, the Christian emperor. And maybe that's the way to put it. The, the, the Roman, the Byzantine, and the Russian emperors were Christian emperors. Um, so the other part to this is that we are taught by God to um, respect and support the governments of the lands in which we, we live. Uh, here in the United States, basically, you know, a lot, Australia, all, all kinds of places, there's never been an Orthodox or, or Christian emperor. And uh, we have representative governments, for better or for worse, and we are called on to do what we can to support those and make them more Christian and more and better. So the my thought there is that regardless of the the form of the government, as long as it's bringing uh, peace, order, uh, the ability to live out a Christian life, then we we support it. Now it changes, of course, in Russia after the the revolution where. It's a God-hating government. And this is why the, uh, the true Orthodox don't commemorate the, the, the civil authorities. Um, and, you know, by and large, that's what we're seeing more and more of uh, throughout the world, that the, the powers that uh, rule the lands are opposed to Christianity, to true Christianity, certainly. And so as a result of that, we pray that God um, preserves the faithful people. Now, in, I think it was 2017, the, the Council of the Russian True Orthodox Church added a petition in the Ectenias for uh, the restoration of a pious and God-fearing Tsar. And this was a petition that was in the, the Russian services up through the, uh, the fall of the Romanov uh, dynasty, that they were praying for the, a pious and, the a pious and God-fearing Tsar. So it's kind of a restoration of that. At least that's the, what it's modeled on. Um, this is a, a petition that is really important because if God were to provide a pious and God-fearing Tsar, a lot of the evil that goes on could be at least resisted, if not undone. Now, you know, we look at the, the, the current state of affairs and the claimants, the pretenders to this, the Russian throne are anything but pious and God-fearing. But then, uh, who would have who would be able to predict what God could do? Uh, with all, God, all things are possible, and so it is a, a proper petition. It also keeps our our minds and our hearts focused on what is needful. So uh, that's one of the reasons I think that that uh, we can use their, that petition with a, a good conscience and hope for for God to fulfill it. I'm wondering, Father, the, I'm thinking about how St. John of Kronstadt was there with the dying dying emperor, I think it was Alexander III, um, and he's cradling the, the Tsar's head in, in his hands while the, while the Tsar breathes his last uh, earthly breaths. And he was obviously a great supporter of, of the, the royal family. And I'm wondering if, if that itself was some sort of image of what of what St. John of Kronstadt represented, like one of the great supporters of the Royal family. And, and I, I don't know, did you, I don't know, did you, did you have any thoughts on that father? Maybe it's just a, an observation that, that doesn't warrant a response. Yeah, um, it's a, it's a very interesting detail. What's even more interesting is that Alexander says to him, I didn't dare ask you to come. Um, recognizing as he did that he was dying that uh, he becomes very humble uh, here he is of course the autocrat um, 
he has power of life and death over over basically most of the people in the, in the empire. Uh, but he was a he was a believer, and he knows that he's he's dying. He knows that he is going to come face to face with God, and he's going to have to give an answer for his rule. And Saint John, whether it was through clairvoyance or some other means, is there as he is dying. He gives the the uh, emperor confession and communion. Uh, it's, it's, I think he also said anointing. Well, that would be the unction service. Um, so he's giving him the mysteries, and then he's doing what he can to ease the emperor's uh, suffering. Um, it's definitely uh, significant. The uh, Saint John of Kronstadt was always a a devoted or a faithful uh, supporter of the the monarchy because he saw that as the bulwark for keeping Russia orthodox, uh, and he was right about that. Um, and so his care for the emperor is analogous, perhaps uh, synonymous with his care for the, the whole of the Russian land. I'm also wondering, just, just in general from this life, we read about how the, like thousands of people following St. John and even people waiting on the, on the banks of rivers while he's on, um, while he's on a boat and while he's on boats and people who are swarming to him just to even try to touch his garments. And it's like he was like a he was like a a, a type very obviously I think a type of Christ for the Russian people. You see this with other saints, uh, Saint Seraphim Asarov, Saint Sir, uh, Sergei of Rodnezh. Uh, there are saints that are universal for the Russian land, and and these three are that uh, I just mentioned. Um, are examples of that. Some of the other ones would be the uh, Optina elders, uh, who the the simple folk as well as the the nobility and the, the ones that have faith, uh, the merchants, people with money, what have you. The whole cross section of the the population that are faithful see in the them that they are in effect living saints. And so they respond to them, they come to them. Um, that is, that's something that I guess we have a hard time understanding right now because we don't see it. There, there are no universal saints of, a, of the Russian land or the Greek land or the American land or the Australian land uh, that, uh, that we, we experience perhaps the closest would be St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco. Uh, everywhere he went, uh, the, the people who knew him in particular that had been with him in, in China, uh, they, they did the same kind of thing. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a much different scale. You don't have you know, 10,000 people attending the liturgies of St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco. Uh, we live in a time that is that faith is very, very dulled. There's, it's not, it's not shining out to uh, to be visible across the whole land, which it was with Saint John of Saint John of Kronstadt. Um, the the thing we have to do in our day and age is keep alive the memory of these saints as the the true state of faith in a land and people and which should be the true state of faith in ourselves. Um, but it also said in the life that, you know, people would come to him that would be maybe questioning, some doubting, uh, some to just to see a, a, be entertained to see something unique. And, and we saw that, we see that in the, in the life of our Lord, Jesus Christ himself, where the, the people who come to him aren't always the ones who, who believe in him or are faithful. Some of them are pretty hostile to him, uh, and they're seeking to trip him up. 
I'm not sure that anybody was trying to trip up St. John of Kronstadt, you know, because they, they think, well, maybe he's a phony or something like that. It doesn't really talk about that. But who I mean, who knows what was in the hearts of the people who, who come to him who are not faithful? Father, what should we take away from the fact that such a, uh, like an, an unbelievably holy wonder worker was sent an agonizing physical ailment in his last years by God? We see that in the lives of numerous saints. Um, well, let's not forget that no matter how holy and uh, elevated the spiritual life of, of these saints are, they're still human beings. They still commit sins. And so um, the illnesses, uh, that's a way of um, giving us suffering so that we can be purified. Uh, the, also, in the, in the case of some of the great saints, is it's a, a means of revealing another dimension of their sanctity. Because is that because they they are able to accept these things with with gratitude and without complaining, Father? Yes. Right. Right. I only had one final question tonight, Father, and I have asked you a lot of questions. Um, I just wonder if you have any words on on St. John's book, My Life in Christ, and if you recommend that um, generally for, for all of our people. And Yeah, your thoughts, Father. If you haven't read My Life in Christ, read it. And you can read it even simply a page at a time. It, it's or it's not even necessarily a page, it's broken into vignettes or little sections. They're basically entries in his diary. Uh, you read one or two or three of these a day and you will gain great spiritual insight. If you have read it, pick it up again and read it again. You know, the, the life said it very well. Uh, it's, it's akin to the writings of the fathers and it gives a, a clear spiritual instruction. Very often, the sort of thing that uh, that you might need at the moment you're reading it, if you had something maybe you didn't even think about, where uh, there's a consolation that can be found in it. it it's one of the the spirit, the great spiritual uh, treasuries. And uh, initially, I believe they, Saint John didn't want it published. Um, but his disciples um, convinced him to let it to become public, and and then they edited it and, and brought it into into public into the public. Uh, thank you, Father, and and you can you can read the whole book online for for free on um, ccel. I think it's the website ccel.org or .com. And in addition to that, you can, you can download it as a PDF. You can also just read it on their website. Um, the whole book is recorded in audio form and you can listen to it for free on LibriVox and also on archive.org. You can download all of the audio book in MP3. Um, it was recorded by, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think it was recorded by a nun on the east coast of america and she did like an amazing job um reading it it wasn't she didn't come across as haughty it wasn't mel melodramatic it was very even and very well done before uh, john Grostad fell asleep he was visited by two bishops uh probably metropolit the Kirill of kazan and um and john uh, no john but from petersburg pro probably and uh, he, he, they were talking for quite a long time. And after that, those uh, bishops were turning back crying. Probably John of Kronstadt uh, said him, uh, what is going on, what is going to, to happen with uh, Russian church in the future? They were crying. Yeah, that's correct. There's, there's several accounts of uh, his prophecies about the the future of Russia and um, and of the Russian church um, that's a lesson to us too I mean he, uh, his words that uh, it was going to fall 
by this just judgment of God if the people didn't repent and change their ways. This is applicable today for us as it was then for the Russians. Uh, and we just look through church history and we see that uh, nations or peoples that turn their backs on God will ultimately come to a reckoning. Someone, if you're going to live in the law with the law of the jungle, the jungle, somebody in the jungle is going to come along that's bigger and stronger than you, and they're going to clobber you. It's only by the grace of God that any of us are able to withstand the workings of the enemy. Yeah, there, uh, there's a number of uh, accounts of uh, bishops and and other people close to him. Uh, being very much sobered by his his deathbed conversations. I'll say you're not sure about his relics because uh, I said said sent you a link. Uh, they're hidden at the marmor uh, plate, and um, but as you know, the Bolsheviks usually destroyed all the relics of the saints. And uh, I read some memories of the dukes of. Urusova, she was living in the uh, United States probably, and, and of course she was a member of a rocker, and she states that uh, his relics were destroyed also. But we're not sure because they're hidden, we cannot see them. I know the Soviets have, uh, have opened everything up to say, well, here it is, <laughs> just like they have with the Royal Martyrs. Uh, yeah, they are also creating the fake relics for the some saints because, uh, for example, for Alexander the Svirsky in north of Russia in Ladina Poly Monastery, he was there. Yes. And he is a, he's a saint of the 13th century and one of the saints from the New Testament who saw the three, three faces of God, three angels, angels um, visited him. And... Um, for now, uh, for now, uh, I heard that uh, his relics is a body of the some Asian people, as Asian 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 nationality men with a bullet in the in the neck. So this is there is a sign of the bullet. So and we are not sure, Elsa, uh, as it truly or not. And that, too, is a lesson for us. Uh, Clem, you're absolutely right that uh, the Soviets are not above falsifying, faking uh, these things, the relics and so forth, basically so for, for financial gain and for some uh, credibility or status. Our faith does not depend upon um, relics or upon uh, miracle working icons. Our faith depends upon our relationship with God. God permits uh, the relics of saints to work miracles. He permits icons to work miracles as a, a bolster to our faith so that we have a stronger faith. But if we lose sight of who and what God is, then we basically have turned the relics or these other the miracle working icons, what have you, into gods themselves. We must always remember that the holiness of the saints is a reflection of the holiness of God and nothing more. They are not in and of themselves something that we should be seeking because if we're looking for signs and miracles and so forth, Christ has told us, we'll get the signs and the miracles, but they're not going to be Salvific. You have to know that uh, the Soviet Church uh, was never free. It was uh, the department of the KGB and all the social life in Soviet Russia, uh, all the sides of our life, social life, were controlled by the KGB. So it was never free, Soviet Church. I um, just found a, uh, just one of the um, paragraphs that you posted Father Tekin I think it was a few days ago um, about one of the monks that renounced the world and gave all his possessions 
you know, to the poor, but he kept some back for himself. And then um, Arba Anthony told him to, to um, I think it was to buy meat and clothe himself in the meat. And then he was, um, you know, it was torn off him by by dogs or animals, and um, you know he said, I think I'll just read. He said, "Those who renounce the world but want to keep something for themselves are torn in this way by the demons who make the war on who make war on them." And I just found it interesting when um, Father John would give away everything without even looking at the envelope. So it, just seeing that parallel. I guess showing his belief that God would provide to him everything that he needs. There's uh, several accounts of St. John doing just that. And it turned out that the money that was in the envelope was precisely the amount that the person needed for whatever it was that they were needing the money. Um, and it's as if he knew what their need was without them asking. He knew what was in the envelope. And by the grace of God, it had been arranged such that that amount was just the amount they needed. Uh, and he was able to give it away, which also, of course, is a point that we keep in mind that we should be praying for what is needful and not for what is beyond that. 